Psalm 107, Psalm 107, Psalm 107. Well, you're turning to Psalm 107. I'm sure most of you probably know this, but uh, who wrote the Star Spangled Banner? Who wrote it? Scott Key. What was his first name? Francis. Where did he, where did he write it? On a ship in Baltimore Harbor. Uh, and as Dave mentioned, this is really the uh, 200th anniversary of that. He wrote it during what war? War of 1812. Uh, who attacked Baltimore Harbor? Who attacked Baltimore? Eng British, English. They had already attacked Washington and burned the White House. Uh, if you go to the White House and you get a really good tour of it, they'll take you around back and then show you a burned beam a burned beam that's still there from when the White House was uh, burned by the British uh, in uh, 1814. Who was president at that time? Thank you. Because we know that Dolly Madison, who went into the baking business afterwards, uh, <laughs> rescued George Washington's picture uh, from the White House uh, as they were fleeing. Um, and so the British, having um, burned Washington, came up the coast, and they attacked. There was a battle at North Point in which the Maryland militia came out and fought against the British. The, the British, I guess we say technically won, but they withdrew. And then the, the British tried to attack uh, Baltimore. Why was Francis Scott Key on that British boat? Yes. B, I believe his name was B-E-A-N-E, -E, Bean. And uh, because the British had captured him, and they, of course, uh, wanted uh, Scott Key and another guy. What was Francis Scott Key's occupation? Anybody know? Lawyer. He was a lawyer. Anybody know where he was from? Boston. Oh, good guess, John. But no, that's incorrect. He was from Frederick, Maryland, and he had come, as, as you said, to arrange the release of this Dr. Bean. And it, they, he and a friend went out to the uh, flagship of the British, and uh, they tried to arrange the man's release. They showed, uh, at first, the British refused to let him go. Uh, they were talking about this over dinner, and the British refused to let this guy go. But then they brought out letters from uh, British soldiers, uh, which attest to the fact that this Dr. Bean had been very kind to them and had been very helpful to them. And so then the British agreed to let him go. The only problem was that uh, Francis Scott Key and the other guy were sitting at the dinner table on the ship eating with them while the admiral, the vice admiral, and the captain of the ship were discussing the plan for the attack of Baltimore Harbor. So they would not let them go. They had to stay on there. Uh, and of course, we know, oh, say, can you see by the dawn's early light what so proudly we hailed at the twilight's last gleaming. Uh, we've you may have seen, you may have seen it, if you've ever been to the Smithsonian, uh, the flag that flew over Fort McHenry is there. It's quite large. I mean, it is very, very large. That flag probably was not flying that night, uh, but the weather flag, which was somewhat smaller, it was 17 by, I believe, 24, is how big that flag was. The, other, the one that was so big uh, the next morning, the one that, the 17 by 24 was because it was raining much of that night. And so the next morning when it had stopped, they raised the, the huge flag up over Fort McHenry. The British tried to land to the east of the fort, but there was another smaller fort, Fort Covington over there, that repelled the British as they tried to come ashore. They did bombard the fort all that night. There are many miraculous things that happened. I remember when... when uh, when I lived in Baltimore and we got to go to Fort McHenry, uh, I must have been in about the first grade when we went. But I very clearly remember the, the guy giving us the, the tour of it, and they took us over to the magazine where they kept all the, the bombs and all the powder, and he said that a, a British rocket lit, landed in the magazine of the fort, but the floor was made out of, was sand and so that the rocket actually literally buried itself in the sand and went out. 
I, I, you say, well, that's a coincidence. No, I don't think it was a coincidence. I believe that God protects his hand upon America. Of course, they could not take the fort. They did bomb it all night long. Um, huge bombs. I mean, there's, when I was at Chickamauga the last time, I, I saw a, uh, my brother and I saw a, a uh, park ranger, and he explained about cannons. And uh, they, they're talking about six pounders and 12 pounders, and he said the reason that they call them that is because that's how big the cannonball was. It was a 12 pound cannonball. Those things would shoot over a mile. Um, uh, on the British ship, they had mortars, and, and the mortars, the, the mortar balls were huge uh, that they shot at the fort. Um, if I remember, there were either five or none. You may remember that better than I. Uh, men actually killed at the fort. Um, but, uh, oh, say, can you see by the dawn's early light? He wrote it, he wrote it on the back of an envelope that he had, uh, and he Truly, he genuinely did come on board the next morning and, sit and wrote, Oh, say, can you see? He finished it up uh, at a hotel that he was staying at in Baltimore uh, the next day after that they were released. But this is the 200th anniversary. And, of course, it wasn't the, the national anthem. I, do, I, am, I, am, I know that it was not officially made the national anthem. America did not have a national anthem for a long, long time. And um, I forget who it was. Somebody wrote the, oh, I know, it was John Philip Sousa, wrote that uh, the Star Spangled Banner was a fitting and appropriate song to be the national anthem of the United States of America for its spirit and its tune. It was written to an old English tune. Uh, there were other songs that had been written to that. The Star Spangled Banner, of course, is, is somewhat difficult to sing, uh, I'm not sure what key it's in, but I know it starts in the, in the note of F, but it ranges the full octave. I mean, it, it is sometimes hard to sing. But oh, say, can you see by the dawn's early light what so proudly we hailed at the twilight's last gleam? I mean, what a song that is. Amen. So we're thankful tonight. I'm thankful. I don't know about the rest of you, but I'm thankful tonight uh, for America and for God's protection over us. All right, we're in Psalm 107. Now for the history lesson tonight, Psalm 107. Let's stand, shall we? We're going to read just a couple verses tonight from Psalm 107. Oh, give thanks unto the Lord, for he is good, for his mercy endureth forever. I used this verse, these verses several Wednesday nights ago. Let the redeemed of the Lord say so, whom he hath redeemed from the hand of the enemy, and gather them out of the lands from the east and from the west and from the north and from the south. They wandered in the wilderness in a solitary way. They found no city to dwell in. Hungry and thirsty, their soul fainted in them. Then they cried unto the Lord in their trouble, and he delivered them out of their distresses. And he led them forth by the right way, that they might go to a city of habitation. Oh, that man would praise the Lord for his goodness and for his wonderful works to the children of men. Father, we thank you again for your word tonight. And Lord, we do thank you for America. And Lord, we've come a long, 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 long way 1812, 1814, when he wrote that song. Lord, we, we've, we've drifted so terribly. We've let things slip. But Lord, tonight, despite the problems, despite all the obstacles that seem to be, Lord, we are thankful for our country tonight. Thankful, Lord, that we can, Lord, stand in this place and still read the word of God in somewhat freedom. Lord, we know that many places around the world Many, many places the church is persecuted. The church is underground. Uh, the church is in hiding uh, because the governments of the world so hate Christ and so hate God. But Lord, we're thankful tonight that we can still, in somewhat relative freedom, uh, meet together as believers in Christ. Lord, thank you for allowing us to be the privilege and the opportunity, Lord, of availing ourselves of the opportunity to be here tonight. Father, we pray again that you'll encourage us this evening, we pray in Jesus' name, amen. And amen, you may be seated. I want us to note Psalm 107 and verse 2. It's a verse that is oft times quoted. It says, let the redeemed of the Lord say so, whom he hath redeemed from the hand of the enemy. Let the redeemed of the Lord say so. Jump back, if you would, to the book of Acts, chapter 26, Acts chapter 26. Let the redeemed of the Lord say so. I guess my, 
briefly tonight, if we might, our, as usual, we, but whatever, in, Psalm, in uh, Acts chapter 26. I guess tonight, if I might speak to you just for a few minutes about, let the redeemed of the Lord say so. Let the redeemed of the Lord say so. If you're saved tonight, you ought to have a say so. Amen? You ought to have something that uh, you can give testimony to the fact to. I don't know whether uh, uh, somebody here, whether I heard it, but I heard it somewhere. Maybe it was a missionary we had here. Maybe somebody said it to me, spoke to me. I don't remember. But the Apostle Paul, when he went around, basically that's what he did. He gave his testimony about what happened. In Acts chapter 26, Acts 26, it tells us that Agrippa said to Paul, Paul, you're free uh, to defend yourself. And Paul said, okay, he said, most gladly, he said, in verse 2, he said, I think myself happy, King Agrippa, because I shall answer for myself this day before, the, uh, before thee, touching all the things whereof I am accused of the Jews. And so Paul begins to give his testimony. Now, it, it, it tells about what he did. He said in verse 10, which thing I also did in Jerusalem, and many of the saints that I shut up in prison, having received authority from the chief priest, and when they were put to death, I gave my voice against them. Here Paul's recounting uh, what happened to him before he was saved. And we know what happened with Paul. Paul, of course, was a persecutor of the church, and he consented to the death of Stephen. Uh, he was there, and evidently, when we read verse 10, it says, and when they were put to death. Stephen was probably not the only person that Saul consented to have put to death for their faith in Christ. I gave my voice against them, and I punished them off in every synagogue and compelled them to blaspheme. I mean, Paul was, uh, was a hater of it and being exceedingly mad against them. Paul was like a mad dog when it came to Christianity. You'll remember in, in chapter 7, look at chapter 7 quickly if you would, chapter 7 of Acts, Acts chapter 7, Acts 7, and uh, verse 53, who have received the law by the disposition of angels and have not kept it. When they heard these things, that was Saul, and that was the Pharisees, the Sadducees, the whole religious crowd, and the Jews that they had stirred up. When they had heard these things, they were cut to the heart, and they gnashed on him with their teeth. I mean, they were, they were chomping at him like mad dogs. And Paul said that he was mad against that. And it was, he being full of the Holy Ghost, looked up steadfastly into heaven and saw the glory of God and Jesus standing on the right hand of God. We've surmised, where, how far is heaven? It can't be very far if, if Stephen saw it that day. I see the heavens open and the Son of Man standing on the right hand. Then they cried out with a loud voice. They screamed. They, they didn't want to hear it. I mean, they were, they were vocal in it so that they could not hear what Stephen. And they stopped their ears. They stuck their fingers in their ears. And they were screaming. They did not want to hear what Stephen was saying. Paul said that he was mad against it. Look, jump back to chapter 26. Paul said this in 26. He said that I was uh, mad against it, exceedingly mad against them. I persecuted them even under strange cities. He went around looking for Christians. He tried to find them in other cities. He was mad against it. Now, uh, we can take that man one of two ways. One, he was just plain flat angry about the fact that he being a Jew, that there was another, can we use this word religion, there was a new religion in town that was taking over, and he was mad about that. He did not like that. He was upset about it, mad about it. But I don't think that's what the word mad there means. I, means that he, I believe it means he was like a raving lunatic, escaped from an insane asylum. He was so uh, against Christianity. He was insane. Paul, Paul says that he was insane against Christianity. Now, that's what he said. Whereupon, as I went to Damascus with authority and commission from the chief priest. Now remember, I let the redeemed of the Lord say so. Well, what did Paul do? He just went around telling people what happened. At midday, O king, this is the first time that Paul gives his testimony in the book of Acts. As you read through the book of Acts, you'll find that Paul gives, or Saul, at this point, gives his testimony several times. 
At midday, O king, I saw in, a, in the way a light from heaven, where the, uh, above the brightness of the sun. Can I just say this quickly? I want to say it whether I can or not. I said this morning that when Jesus comes, he'll come in a, in a glorious bright. When Saul, on the road to Damascus that day, saw Jesus, he said it was brighter than the sun at, at midday. When Jesus returns, when Jesus returns in glory, he's going to return in the brightness of his glory. Uh, that, that's why, that's why at, at the Battle of Armageddon, he won't have to say anything, but he'll, they'll be destroyed by the brightness of his coming. Anyway. Back to our point. Midday, O king, I saw the way a light from heaven above the brightness of the sun shining round about me and them which journeyed with me. And when we were all fallen to the earth, I heard a voice speaking unto me and saying in the Hebrew tongue, Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? It is hard for thee to kick against the pricks. Of course, pricks are stickers, and, and if you've ever been through green briars, you know, boy, they're pretty tough to go through. And uh, 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 Paul was under Saul keep saying, but it was Paul, Saul, Paul. Saul was under great conviction. He was under great conviction. When Stephen died and Saul was standing there and he said, I see the Son of Man standing at the right hand, Saul was under great conviction. You, now, you say, well, you would have never known it. You would Look, we don't know what's going on in people's lives. We really don't know. And that's why it's so important to, to plant the seed and water the seed from time to time. He said, uh, uh, I was with him and I heard a voice in Hebrew, Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? It is hard for thee to kick against the pricks. And I said unto thee, Who art thou, Lord? And he said, I am Jesus, whom thou persecutest. Arise and stand upon thy feet, and I, for I have appeared unto thee for this purpose, to make thee a minister and a witness both of these things which thou hast seen and of the things which I will appear unto thee, delivering from the people and from the Gentiles unto whom now I send thee to open their eyes and to turn them from darkness to light and from the power of Satan unto God that they may receive forgiveness of sins and inheritance among them which are sanctified by faith that is in me. So Paul said, this is what happened. Agrippa said, uh, Saul, why don't you tell us exactly what happened? Now the Jews, of course, had accused Saul of uh, trying to uh, subvert uh, Judaism, uh, but Saul wasn't trying to do that at all. He was trying, as Jesus said, this is what I want you to do. He said, I want you to open their eyes and to turn them from darkness to light and from the power of Satan unto God. Whereupon, O King Agrippa, I was not disobedient unto the heavenly vision, but showed first unto them of Damascus and at Jerusalem and throughout all the coast of Judea and then to the Gentiles that they should repent. There's that word, repent. Again, repent. Uh, people have the idea, man, you've got to change your whole life and you've got to do things all over and you've got to do all those things. Look, if I could change my life before I was saved, see, I, I wouldn't need Jesus. See, the word repentance means to change your mind. What did Paul do? He changed his mind. He was a Christ hater. That's what he was. He hated Christ. He hated Christianity. He hated it. But he repented or he changed his mind which then led to a change of action in his life. Now it says there, for this cause, the Jews caught me in verse 21 and went about to kill me. Now, so what, what, what did Saul do? Saul merely gave his testimony. People say, you know, preacher, I, I, I really, I, I don't know what, what to say. Well, here's what you say. Here's what you say. You tell people what happened to you. What happened to you? If I were to ask Pete over there tonight, Pete, what happened to you? What happened to you? Pete, what happened to you? Pete, tell me. Pete, tell me. What happened to you, Pete? What happened to you? I was changed. You were changed. And how, what, what was it that you were changed? Pete, give me two minutes. What happened that night in 1969? Well, after I received Christ, it was quite a relief. Man. And of course, naturally, you've heard my testimony about going to the, the plane again at the hotel. It never bothered me before, like you said, but that night, it opened the whole world up to me. And I just turned to the guy and says, I can't play here no more. You better, better find somebody else. And even today, it bothers me even to go in and sit down to eat in a place like that. So he changed me in a moment. 
in the twinkling of an eye, I guess. Amen. Uh, James, see, the, to, for the, let the redeemed of the Lord say so. If you're going to say so, if you're going to give a testimony, you know, you, you need to know what happened. What did the Apostle Paul say? Well, I was on the road. To, I, I persecuted the church of God. I hated the church of God. I was insane against the church of God. I was on the way to Damascus to arrest some people and bring them back to Jerusalem. When while I was on the way, I was under great conviction. He was under great conviction. And I was under conviction because of the stoning of Stephen when a bright light shone about me. And uh, it was as bright as the noonday sun. And he said, and I fell to the ground and I heard an Hebrew in my language, Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? See, if you're going to say so, and Alex gets up here and, and uh, he says, okay, who's got a testimony tonight? Who's got a testimony tonight? Who's got a testimony tonight? Anybody got a testimony? Anybody got a testimony? Anybody got a testimony? Anybody got a testimony? Hey, who's got a testimony? Anybody got a testimony? And everybody just kind of sits there. It says, well, and people say, well, I don't know what to say. Well, just say what happened. Somebody told me this uh, in our church. Someone told me this uh, not too long ago. And they said to me, they said, you know, preacher, I really like it when people give their testimonies. I, I really like that. Because when they give their testimonies, it encourages me uh, in my Christian life. You say, well, I really don't have anything to say. Well, sure you do. Uh, uh, just stand up and say what happened. You say, well, well what happened? Well, you say, I say to you, do you not know what happened? If I, if I were to say to you tonight, oh, when did you get saved? Well, I got saved. Now, again, some people will say this. Well, I, I got saved on, uh, what's today? I got saved on, is today the 14th or the 13th? Anyway, I got saved on the 14th. It's got to be the 14th. I got saved on the 14th of, uh, of September. Now, not everybody knows that they got saved on the 14th of September. You know what I mean? Come on now. You say, well, I wasn't. I was saved on the 3rd of July or uh, the 22nd of January. Uh, but somebody says, well, I really don't know the exact day that I was saved. I don't. If I were to ask you what day you were born on, if I were to say to you, what day were you born, you say, and I would say, I was born on September 10th. And you would say, well, how do you know you were born on September 10th? Well, I was there. I was born on September 10th. That's not the reason I know I was born on September 10th. I know I, I, I was there, and my mother told me I was born on September the 10th. Not everybody remembers the day. You can't remember the day sometimes. None of us can remember the day that we were born, physically born. And sometimes people say, well, I don't remember the day, preacher. I don't remember the day that I was saved. I can't tell you the day. I can tell you the day. It was a Sunday night. It was about 8.30. And it was on March the 16th. I can, I can remember the day. I can remember where it was. I can remember what happened. Somebody else say this. I don't remember. I, I, I think, Dave, Dave, did you? Dave, Dave, tell me, Dave, tell me where were you saved that, Dave? Let's say the 8th Baptist Church on the west of New York, May 6th. Uh, were, were you in church? Okay. Uh, okay, Dave was in church when he got saved. My good friend Bob Carpenter, our good friend Bob Carpenter, who has gone to heaven now, two men showed up at his house one night. I've heard him give this testimony a ton of times out visiting. He said, two men showed up at my house, and I let them in, and I wondered, what do these guys really want? Carp and I were somewhere one night. He went to visit an old girlfriend. Now, I'm telling you, that was not probably the best plan of the thing, but <laughs> we went to visit an old girlfriend, and her husband was there. Now, we're talking Carp is in his 70s, and this was when they're back in school in his teens and stuff. But well, we went to visit her, and, and, uh, and, and Bob's talking the way Bob talks. And, uh, and uh, finally, her husband said, what are you guys selling? And, uh, you know, I'm tempted to say, but I didn't. I didn't say anything. And J Carp just said, well, you know, we're, we're, we're just out telling people about Jesus, what happened. And Carp said this. I remember him saying this so many times. He said, uh, those two men came to my house. And they talked to me, and I thought to myself, what do those guys really want? What do they really want? But he said it was either that night or the next night or shortly thereafter that. He told me, and I heard him tell other people this, that he was laying in his bed, in his bedroom at night. And God revealed to him, after those men had talked to him, God revealed to him what a dirty, he's, and this was his words, what a dirty, rotten, stinking mess that he really was. 
And he said, I told the Lord, I, I said, Lord, if you'll take my life and if you'll save me, he said, uh, I'll do my best to live for you. Listen, you may not be saved in church. I was saved in church. Dave was saved in church. I know people that were saved in their car. I, I remember a fellow that was saved driving down the road, and, and God revealed to him what a mess he was. And, and he pulled over beside the road, and he prayed and asked the Lord to save him in his car driving down the road. Uh, I, I'm, I'm saying that you, you, you say, well, I don't remember the date. I don't remember the date. But, man, even if you don't remember the date, you ought to remember what happened. And you ought to remember where you were. You say, well, I was, you know, sitting on a tractor drinking a Coke. Good thing to be doing. I was sitting on a tractor drinking a Coke, and, and uh, God, God spoke to my heart. And, and, and I realized that, and again, as I said this morning, uh, sometimes you just got to plant the seed with somebody. And, and then somebody else will come along and water it. Well, somebody planted a seed with, uh, with Brother Bob, and, and uh, somebody else probably watered it. And then after a while, the Holy Spirit brought that conviction. And I, I heard Carp give his testimony many, many times to many different people. What did Paul do? All he did was go around and give his testimony about what happened in his life when he gave his defense before Agrippa here in chapter 26. All he did was give his testimony about what happened in his life. Surely you can give a testimony about what happened in your life and say, well, I am somewhat fearful. Well, what's the Bible say? I'll not be afraid what men can do to me. Besides that, if I were to honestly ask Alex tonight, and I were to say to Alex, uh, Alex, if uh, Doug gets up and gives a testimony, are you going to go beat him up for doing that? I didn't think so. See, me, we have this great fear. We have a fear. And we have not been saved unto a spirit of fear, but of a sound mind and a power and of might. Look, uh, uh, we have been saved. You say, well, I'm afraid. Afraid of what? what, what are, well, seriously, when you think about the people, are you afraid of Mrs. Ward? I mean, come on, are you afraid of Mrs. Ward? You're afraid of Mrs. Ward. What's she going to do, call you up and, and breathe heavily into the telephone and hang up on it? I mean, seriously, I'm afraid of what Mrs. Ward may, may, may say. You know what she's going to say? She's going to think, man, that's great. That's wonderful. You know what I think every time? I've heard Pete Fitzgerald's testimony. I bet I've heard it a hundred times if I was a betting guy. I never get sick of hearing it. I mean, when he said tonight, he said, and I don't remember, he said, I turned to that guy and said, I can't do this anymore. And what a testimony. That's an encouragement to me. He said, I can't do this anymore. People say, well, preacher, I, I don't know. I, I, I really it kind of a, then this is what you need to do. Here's what you need to do. You need to be reminded. You need to remind yourself, okay, this is what happened. This is what happened. If you said to me tonight, preacher, what happened to you? I can remember very clearly. I remember it very clearly. I remember church was over, and I think they charged, started church at Brother Don's church. I think they started at 730 at night. I believe they started because when they started, they had a bunch of farmers in the church. And so they started at 7.30 so the farmers could get done so they could get to church. And I believe we started at 7.30 at 8.30. It was more like quarter to nine. He was kind of like me. But about quarter to nine, he let out church. I'm standing around talking with my friends. And I walk out the side door to go out the back door. And my father was standing there at that door. And my father said to me, son, he said, wouldn't you like to talk to the preacher about, being, about going to heaven? So wouldn't you like to talk to him? I, 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 that wasn't the first time I'd heard that. That wasn't the, the second time I'd heard that. I had heard that many, many times. He said, wouldn't you like to talk to the preacher about going to heaven? Wouldn't you like to talk to him? And my reply to my father was, was this. I can remember very clearly. I said, well, Dad, do you want me to go to heaven? He said, absolutely, I do. I said, let's go talk to him. And I can remember going to the office, and I can remember him going down and uh, uh, show me some verses, and I can remember praying. Now, you don't have to do this. You don't have to do this. But I seriously remember, I mean, it's like yesterday, like this giant weight fell off my back. You say, well, preacher, I didn't feel anything like that. Well, that's okay. 
You don't have to feel. Somebody says, well, I had goosebumps when I got saved. I mean, uh, chill bumps or whatever you want to call them. You know, you're, you're cold. Huh? I, somebody said that. The, the hair on my head, and I had hair at that time. And, you know, the hair on my head stood up when I got saved. Somebody else said, man, I was really happy. Somebody else says, well, I, I, I didn't really uh, experience anything. I mean, I just I prayed, and I asked the Lord to save me and to come into my heart. Uh, somebody says, well, I jumped up and down for joy. Uh, somebody else says, well, I, I was in my, my home. I, I know if you ask Pete, he'll tell you. I believe, Pete, you would say that when you got saved, you knelt down by the coffee table in your living room, didn't you? Something like that. Sounds good. Okay, all right. And so uh, somebody says, uh, 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 but, but here's the thing that you need to do. You need, you need to sit down sometime or other, and you need to remember what it is. Now, you may not remember the day. You may not remember the day. But surely you ought to remember what happened. You ought to remember what happened. Look, if you will, quickly at at uh, 2 Timothy, 2 Timothy, 2 Timothy, chapter 1. This is what Paul says. Here's Paul's. Paul had another testimony. This is it. 2 Timothy, chapter 1, verse 10. But now is made manifest by the appearing of our Savior, Jesus Christ, who hath abolished death and hath brought life and immortality to light through the gospel. The good news. Isn't that amazing? Life and immortality through the gospel. Whereunto I am appointed a preacher and an apostle and a teacher of the Gentiles. Now verse 12. For the which cause I also suffer these things. Nevertheless, nevertheless, I am not ashamed. Paul said in Romans chapter 1, I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. You know what? Really, our, our I, I, I hesitate to say this. I don't think that you are. Are you embarrassed? Well, think about it a minute. Are you embarrassed by your testimony? Are you ashamed of your testimony? Are you ashamed of being a Christian? I do not think so. I don't think that you are. Listen to what Paul said. For I am not ashamed, for I know whom I have believed, and am persuaded that he is able to keep that which I have committed unto him against that day. I mean, here, here, here's Paul's testimony again. I know who I have believed. I know that I'm saved. I know that I'm on my way to heaven. Somebody says, well, I'm not eloquent. I can't get up and speak. Sure you can. Paul said this in 2 Corinthians. He said, I prayed three times that God would remove a thorn in the flesh, something that hindered me. Now, people have all surmised, what is it that Paul prayed about uh, that God would remove from him? Nobody really knows. Some have suggested that Paul had an eye disease, that he was very, very difficult for him to see, and, and that he had other people. Now, uh, uh, write these letters out. Uh, some, have suggest, some have suggested that he was um, kind of a short, ugly guy. I don't know how God could change that, but, but uh, that, some have suggested that Paul could not speak, that he was not very, very eloquent in his speech, that he uh, uh, had a speech impediment of some kind. But the Bible says this in Philippians, I can do all things through Christ which strengtheneth me. I can do it. You say, well, preacher, it's hard for me to stand up in front of people. Hard for me to stand up in front of people. After 40 years, it's still hard for me to stand up in front of people. But I can do all things through Christ. What, what is it? What is it that, that, that we need? Let the redeemed of the Lord say so. Just say so. I had someone, someone said this to me. Something had happened to them. Something happened to them, and God miraculously, really miraculously, uh, kind of spared them some real problems. And he, this person said to me, I wanted to stand up and say something, but I didn't know how. Here's, here's what they tell you to do in college. Stand in front of a mirror and practice. 
practice. Just practice. Practice talk yourself. Preacher, that's stupid. No, it'll help you. It, it really will help you. You need to, number one, know what happened. Know what happened. What happened? Well, I, I, I was saved. Uh, I was out in the woods sitting on a stump, and the Spirit of God smote me and, and uh, knocked me off the stump. And, and I got down there right in the woods, and I prayed right there on that stump, and I asked God to save me. Hey, that's a testimony right there. I know whom I believe. Paul said, I was on the road to Damascus when Jesus spoke, spoke to me and said, it's hard for thee. He said, I'm, I'm the guy that you're persecuting. He said, and I was not disobedient to the heavenly vision. I, I just, I, I did what God said. And I, now he said, I go around preaching everywhere. He said, I am a preacher and I'm an apostle. He said, I've been appointed that by God. He said, nevertheless, I suffer th for these things. But he said, I, I, I am not ashamed. I am not ashamed for I know who I have believed it and am persuaded that he is able to keep that which I have committed unto him against that day. Now, you know, we're not for, uh, we, we don't have any women preachers in our church. I was going to say something sarcastic, but I'm not. We don't have any women preachers in our church. But, you know, women give testimonies in our church about what God did for them, about what God did for them. Surely God does something for you at least once during the week. When I was, mm, I would say when I was about 16, and, and I, I, I remember how fearful I was. I was afraid to pray in prayer meeting. Our prayer meeting at, at Dr. McKnight's church was uh, a, a little bit different than what we do. I like our way of dividing up in groups of two or three and, and, and people praying. I, I, I like that. But I was very fearful to pray. I, I was afraid to pray because we would sit in the, in the auditorium like this and four or five, maybe six guys would pray and uh, then the preacher would close in prayer. Uh, I kind of like the way that we do it. Uh, but I, I always felt like God said, man, why don't you pray? Why don't you pray? Holy Spirit prompt me. Why don't you pray? I'm afraid. I'm afraid. I'm afraid. I'm afraid. I'm afraid. I'm afraid to pray. I'm afraid to pray. What, what is it that we're afraid of, really? Well, it's the devil that causes us to be fearful. Uh, fear, I'm just afraid. Afraid of what? I'm afraid of John. Of all the people in the church to be afraid of, he is not the guy to be afraid of. He's a big fuzzy teddy bear. I mean, that's what he is. I'm afraid of the preacher. I'm afraid, I'm afraid that I might make a mistake. Who cares? Who cares, really? I mean, it's like, it's like Mrs. I, I love Mrs. Ward. I, I will say this. Mrs. Ward has come a long way in her relationship with me over the, over the years. I, I did not know this. I really did not know this. I didn't. I mean this. Because if I'd have known this, I would have never. I mean it. I would have never. She used to go home and cry uh, uh, because of things that I would say to her jokingly. She would call Mrs. Carpenter on the telephone. I'm afraid of the preacher. What am I going to do? Pull my gun out and shoot you? No. No. Mrs. Ward makes mistakes. I think she made one this past year. And she makes mistakes. The preacher makes mistakes. I mean, all the time. But I'm talking so fast, I just cover them up, keep right on going. You know, people make mistakes. Well, I'm, I'm, I'm not sure what to say. Go home and stand in front of a mirror and practice. Let the redeemed of the Lord say so. What happened? Man, I got saved. When did you get saved? Well, I don't remember the day that I got saved, but I remember that I, I came under conviction that I was lost and that I needed to be saved. The, the guy, no one ever cared for me like Jesus, Charles Weigel, was about 12 years old uh, when he got saved. And he gave testimony to the fact that when he got saved, he came under great conviction. What happened to you? I came under great conviction. I knew that I was a sinner. I knew that I was lost. I knew that Jesus could save me, and I asked him to save me, and he did save me. That only took about 20 seconds. But let the redeemed of the Lord say so. We have testimony time. Don't be fearful of other folks. We say, well, they might not like my testimony. Who cares? I do. I'll like it. You say, well, uh, I might make a mistake. Who cares? So do I. So does the organ player. I know that she does. So does the piano player. I know that, they, I know that she does. I know that, and I didn't say that in a bad way. 
don't, don't kill me tonight. But anyway, you know, Mrs. Ward, I know people make mistakes. But this morning, Doug's back there playing with the PA. And the thing that is so piercing, my ears are about to burst. So what? Who cares? I don't know. I don't believe God would mind either. I, I really don't believe that God would mind if you stood up to give a testimony and made a mistake about it. Uh, and said something, uh, I seen instead of I saw. I don't think God would really mind if you said that. I, I, I believe that God would be pleased. He's let the redeemed of the Lord say so, who he, whom he hath redeemed out of the hand uh, of the enemy. I mean, just give a testimony. I remember very clearly. I remember this. It, it really is one of the things that, that really uh, shaped me, really. I, I remember this very clearly. I was in college. I was at a very small college, a very small school at the time. And I remember the evangelist got up, and they said, he said this. Hey, let's have popcorn testimonies tonight. Popcorn testimony is simply this. You stand up, 10 seconds. I thank the Lord for saving me. Uh, maybe you give a life verse. Uh, uh, you know, Romans, everybody can give their life verse. Uh, Romans uh, uh, chapter, what is Romans chapter, everybody's life verse is Romans eleven six. And if by grace, then there's nowhere works. I mean, that's everybody's life verse, amen? And uh, I sat there. I sat there. I didn't stand up. I mean, the Holy Ghost is like sticking me in the ribs with his finger and doing that, jabbing me. Why don't you stand up and say something? Stand up and say something. Stand up and say something. And I sat there. I, I, I was on, never under more conviction all my life than I was at night. I will stand up and give a testimony. And I didn't. And I went home. I went back to my dorm. And I sat there, and I sat there, and I said, God, I'm sorry. I'm sorry that I didn't. I said, if I get an opportunity, if I get another opportunity, he said, I'm going to stand up, and I'm going to say so. Well, God said, okay, big boy, we'll just see if you mean that. Because the evangelist the next night said, hey, who's got a popcorn testimony? First guy that popped up was the preacher. Listen, people, people aren't looking at whether you've seen it or saw it. People are listening to your testimony. Let the redeemed of the Lord say so, whom he hath redeemed out of the hand of the enemy. Brother, we've got something to praise the Lord about. Amen. We've got something to tell others about. Amen. And they say, well, preacher, you know, I'm not quite as eloquent as you are. Oh, really? Really? Come on. You can do it. I know you can do it. I know you can do it. Let the redeemed of the Lord say so. What do I got to do? Remember what happened. Just remember what happened. And just give your testimony about that. I was saved. I know Pete's testimony. I've heard so many times. Him and Francis sat over in the street corner in Port Lydon until 10 o'clock at night. And uh, he said to Francis, I love Francis. I miss that guy. He said, I believe the preacher's gone now. Let's go. At 10 o'clock, they pulled into the driveway. And Brother Penrod was sitting there waiting for him. You say... How many times you heard that? I don't know. Don't you ever get tired of it? Never. I never get tired of it. And he said to Uncle Francis, I don't care what happens. I'm not getting saved tonight. And 15 minutes later, he was on his knees praying and asking God to save him. Now, France, that rascal, he did. What was it, three, four weeks maybe? Five weeks? I think he called Brother Penrod like 2 o'clock in the morning, 3 o'clock in the morning. Because I've heard him tell me this, and he said, I can't take this anymore. i got to get saved right now. And uh, Francis got saved that night. You ever get tired of hearing people's testimonies? No, never. Never do. I I've heard yours many times, many of yours many times. Let the redeemed of the Lord say so, whom he hath redeemed out of the hand of the enemy. Father, we thank you again tonight for saving us, for loving us. Lord, despite all of our failures and fumbles and foibles, Lord. We thank you, Lord, for your mercy and your grace to us tonight. Lord, help us not to be fearful of man. Uh, Lord, most of all, our brothers and sisters, uh, Lord, in Christ, uh, Lord, help us not to be fearful about, about that, Lord, and surely help us to be ready to give a testimony of, of your grace to us, uh, Lord, this week. Lord, surely you'll do something for us this week. Surely you'll uh, provide for us or answer a prayer for us or uh, in some way, do something for us this week. Lord, help us to be ready to give a testimony to that. 
And let the redeemed of the Lord say so, we pray. Lord, it doesn't matter how old we are, whether we're six or 60. It doesn't matter. Lord, help us. I pray, give us some spiritual backbone, uh, Lord, that we might just simply say so. I remember Brother Don always said the Methodists used to call them say-so meetings. Say-so meetings, Lord. And Lord, help us not to be ashamed. Help us not to be bashful. Help us not to be shy. But Lord, help us, I pray, that as the redeemed of the Lord, we might learn to say so. Now, Lord, give us traveling mercies, I ask. Give us a good week. Lord, bring us back. Lord, I look forward to prayer meeting. Uh, Lord, this week, Lord, look forward to next Sunday already. Uh, Lord, here another Sunday's gone by. Um, but Lord, we thank, we're thankful for it. Help us, Lord, I pray. Uh, Lord, to do all that we can. Uh, Lord, to reach people with the gospel. I, I, Lord, we know that they're hard, but yet, Lord, the fields are wet unto harvest. And there must be a Cornelius or two out there that is looking for the truth. So help us, we pray. Be ready to give an answer to every man that asketh the reason of the hope that lieth within us, I pray. Keep us safe as we go home tonight now. In Jesus' name, amen and amen.